Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. All right, so welcome back uh, to another part uh, or another section of lecture 13. In this, we will start with looking at an irregular lattice in order to calculate a variogram or a semi-variogram, calculate an experimental variogram to be more precise, right? Uh, we saw how to do it for a regular lattice in the previous, uh, you know, part of this lecture. So what you have on the screen here is an administrative groundwater data set that we, ha we have seen, we have worked with when we did exploratory data analysis, spatial data analysis, right? And, and this data, these data are an irregular lattice. That is, to make, that is to say that if I were to divide the domain of interest, which is the state of Uttar Pradesh, into equidistant cells that are sort of, you know, uh, uh, marked by rows and columns in i and j direction or x and y directions, right, of certain size, I will not have data that is going to be observed in every cell of, you know, uh, in the entire domain, right. To see an example, uh, we can look at any vacant space within the spatial domain of interest. Whenever we see a space that is vacant, for example, the square on the screen, this represents the region which remains, remained unsampled in the year 1998. And that's not surprising. You cannot possibly put, you know, uh, uh, wells. These are wells that are going to have to be dug into the ground to a certain depth. So you can't have at day zero all the places being sampled, right? What is encouraging is there is quite an intensive sampling even in 1998 when, you know, these data set were first made available, right? Uh, now, when you, if you, if you sort of see what happens is, if you have a, you know, row column representation that is data that are, you know, contained in cells, you know, in the entire region, in this cross section that we are looking at, there will be no data. And what is the consequence of that? The consequence is that if we were to sort of transport the idea of, you know, collecting this neighborhood set N H by st starting from a tail and going up to, starting from a tail and going up to a head in a strict direction as, uh, you know, encapsulated in the definition of a spatial lag vector H, then we may not find any corresponding, you know, pairing observation from this tail, right? So, we will have a vacant observation. So, for a lot of locations, while for some locations we are going to find such, such pairs, there are going to be a lot of locations where, where we are not going to be able to find any of these pairs, right? So, what do we do then, right? And this is very important because, see, most of the real world data sets are going to be similar to the one in front of our screen right now, right? In most places when people monitor air pollution levels, they are not going to be able to put these air pollution monitors in a grid, nice looking grid, uh, you know, format so that you have a regular lattice. You are going to encounter irregular lattices when you are working with these real world data sets, okay? So let us see what does, what, what is the work, what is the work around? The workaround is that when you have a, when you have a, a tail to a head, you know, lag vector that you can scan around every part of this data set, you do not make its direction very strict. You allow for the fact that you will be able to, keeping the tail fixed, you will be able to scan a little bit angular 
you know, uh, 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 in angular direction from the strict direction h, which is let us say west to east. Not only that, you also want a possibility that maybe you do not have in the strict east west direction, you do not have any value observed uh, at the head. But if I were to sort of extend the head to be slightly larger, that is h plus delta, then I might have an observation in space. And that is now that gives rise to a strategy of observing data, you know, in order to create this neighborhood set H. That is creating unique pairs that are, you know, separated by, uh, you know, by H. Right. So what we do is instead of taking our scanner, you know, strictly like a line, we basically take a, you know, a, a, a you know, a V-shaped, uh, you know, uh, uh, angular tolerance, which allows me to look at scan for, you know, spatial lags in, you know, in a larger area. Of course, we can't make this too big. We can't make the scanner too big because then we'll be going in some other direction altogether. We don't want to do that. We just want some tolerance so that when we go from, from to lag two, we are not so strict. We are also able to sort of, you know, look for values at a angular tolerance. We are also able to, we also want to be able to look for values slightly farther away from lag 2, which is the H that we, we are working with. So this is H and this is H plus delta. Of course, we do not want this delta to be too big. It is small enough. It is a little tolerance in how far apart are we considering the, you know, lag H. Of course, you know, the, the, the tolerance could also be on the negative side. I mean, at a smaller distance, you might find a little, find a value and you are like, okay, fine, I'm going to take it. Okay. So, we, we sort of, uh, you know, instead of a strict line, uh, you know, uh, 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 representation of a lag vector h, what we do is that we come up with a more envelope, you know, formulation of this lag, uh, you know, vector. It is a lag envelope rather, which has angular tolerance and it has length tolerance in both positive and negative directions. Okay. So, having said that, let us apply this idea to our data set. Now, my irregular lattice is given at the top and at the bottom from left to right, I have three different representations of the lag vectors. The size of the lag vector is exactly the same. So, we can say h is fixed for all three directions, right. When I say 3, I basically am pointing to the three figures on the bottom half of this slide, right. What you see is that h is different due to its direction. In case of the first figure, we are looking at a north-south representation of a lag, spatial lag. In the second, it is a east-west or rather west to east, whichever you prefer. And the third one, we are looking at a southeastern, you know, uh, direction so far as, uh, you know, uh, 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 the spatial lag representation is concerned. In the north-south, if indeed my lag vector was so sort of fixed to be from north to south, you know, all the, all the lag representations in blue should have been parallel to each other, which is not the case, right. Some of them are indeed will look like to be going exactly in the north side direction. For example, the one that I have marked on your screen. But some of them will take advantage of a angular tolerance because I did not find, you know, a head exactly in south, let me just go a slightly right in the direction and find one for myself, right. So, this search panel allows you to collect data with that kind of tolerance. It is also possible that some of these, you know, sticks from north to south are slightly larger or smaller than the exact value of fixed h that we started with, okay. Similar is the case for the east-west, you know, direction. You do not have exactly 
parallel, you have these incline, inclined, you know, uh, H vector representations, which basically is taking advantage of the angular tolerance in our, you know, uh, uh, in our search for the spatial lags or our scanning exercise for spatial lags and the same for the third figure. So, we can stop here for a minute and just visualize, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, how to go about scanning or searching for spatial lags when you are given an irregular lattice, okay. Okay. On the next slide, what I have for you is what I am calling as the semi-variogram cloud. A semi-variogram cloud, first of all, I am saying is, is built on ArcGIS. So, interestingly, I am now also introducing a software on which these things are calculated. It can look rather intimidating that I have to go and scan all the different lags and then collect those pairs and then I have to sort of, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, then calculate the mean squared value, uh, the different squared values for each lag and then sum them and take a mean, right? Well, the software will do it for you. Every data point, every data point that you see on this on this graph is representing a given lag vector h for example the one i've marked in blue represents a lag of about 0.3 units right so h is 0.3 for this h i had a z of s and a z of s minus s plus h that is 0.3 let us say right it is an approximation ok do not take it literally I take them and I square them and I am looking at a semi variogram so I actually divide this value by 2 and that is the value that I observe here as gamma which is around 4.4.5 you know into 10 to the power minus 2 ok. So, this is my gamma h which is given as z s minus z s plus 0.3 in the direction of interest. The direction is east west or west to east right you can see clearly uh, and I and, am and I'm able to sort of get this point. So, for this 0.3 units you can you can see clearly that there are many many pairs ok. There are many many pairs of interest right. So, I may not have been able to mark all of them, but all of these pairs collected together is my neighborhood set n h, the neighborhood set n 0.3, n with 0.3 in parentheses, right. So, a bag that collects all these values, a bag that collects all these values, right, a set collection of all unique you know pairs at h equals 0.3 is denoted as n of 0.3 or n of h equals 0.3 and the modulus of this n 0.3 is nothing but the count of such values. So, what will be the count of these values? Well, we simply count all the yellow crosses on, along the stick that is h equals 0.3 ok. So, this is a semi variogram cloud it is like a scatter plot of data right. The very important thing that we see here is that till now we have whenever we defined the experimental variogram or calculation of variogram we kept h fixed. What we have done here is that we have variable h ok. When I talk about variable h I am talking about you know uh, uh, a process where I am first collecting the unique you know uh, sample pairs of data or data pairs which are separated by h ok. I am varying I am keeping fixed h value and but then I am varying h direction 
second I can vary h value while I have fixed h direction. For all the permutations and combinations that I get with for a given value of h on this semi-variogram cloud, I am only using the distance metric. So, I am plotting all the directions with h equals 0.3 on this vertical line that represents h equals 3. Okay? Now, uh, you know, uh, uh, so, so, so we have moved one step further, we have calculated 2 gamma h for all these unique h values, right? Let us just write this down so that it is absolutely clear in your head what we are up to here. Okay? And then we, we vary these h values, so we create 2 gamma h1, 2 gamma h2, 2 gamma h3, keep going, let us say you have a total of capital M, you know, h values for which you can conduct this exercise. This is the set of all, you know, uh, variogram, experimental variogram values at different uh, spatial lags, right? Now, spatial lags, it will depend on what the domain size is, what the domain shape is and so on and so forth, whether you are working with a regular lattice, you are working with an irregular lattice and, and what not. But the point is now I have a more than one representation of 2 gamma h. h itself has an index j, right? j provides me an, uh, you know, a representation of how many lag vectors am I collecting the data for. This is all going to be an analyst's choice. I can have very fine h, I can have very coarse h values that will determine how large the capital M value is. Once I have these, this set of different 2 gamma h values, what I am going to be able to do is, I am going to be able to have h, you know, on the x axis, 2 gamma h or gamma h, either the variogram to, it does not matter, it is just a scaling by 2, by a multiple of 2, right? And then I am just going to put this one value. Remember. The cloud is different from 2 gamma h. 2 gamma h is a unique value. The cloud is a collection of all these, you know, z i minus z i plus h squared values. Okay? So, uh, so then, you know, we will be able to sort of figure out what these values are at different values of h. Okay? All right. So, going back, we should be able to make a sense of what these things are. When I said gamma h equals this, just be careful, I am not, you know, gamma h is not defined like this. Gamma h is a mean of all these unique values. So, I should not, I in fact should not have used the representation, it is gamma h. It is just a experimental cloud version of gamma h, right. It is not the exact definition of sample gamma h that we see on this slide or what we have studied, okay. All right. So, moving forward, so we will take a digression now and we will ask a question that is the variogram a resistant statistic? What is a resistant statistic? To always to sort of get a sense of a resistant statistic, we can recall the mean and a median of a distribution. So, we have seen earlier that the difference between the mean and median is a reflection of whether or not a uh, you know, given distribution of data are, have a symmetric, you know, PDF. Well, uh, more than that, the distance, the more distant mean and median become, they are also a signal for outlier values, right? The mean value is pulled away by the outlier value in its direction, right? So, if I have a, a you know, a, a left skewed distribution, where the outlier values are sort of towards the right of the distribution, what will happen is that the mean will sort of get pulled in the direction of the outlier, right? 
whereas the median is more resilient to it, right. To get an example, you can simply take the, you know, a sample of sequence of numbers from 1 to 10, calculate its mean and it calculates its median. Now to this sequence, add a number 100, again calculate its mean and calculate its median. You will see that the median remains resistant to this outlier value 100 or 1000 to this original sequence of 1 to 10, right? Whereas the mean sort of runs, you know, in the direction of the outlier, okay? That is why the difference between the mean and median which provided, provided us the U statistic, remember, in the exploratory data analysis allowed us to sort of figure out, you know, whether or not we should be worried about outlier values in a given sequence of data. So the variogram suffers from this issue of outlier values. To see this, just realize that if I have ZSI being 1, being value 10 and ZSI plus H being value 11, then the, the contribution to the variogram is exactly one unit, that is 10 minus 11 the whole squared, which is just 1. But instead, if in local, you know, in, uh, at, the, at the lag H of SI, I had observed a value you know, let us say 1000, then the contribution will become 990 squared, which is a huge contribution to the 2 gamma h value. This will pull 2 gamma h to a greater positive value, which is then a reflection of lower spatial dependence. So, having an outlier value will, you know, create this misjudgment of lower spatial dependence in the data. To see this, look at the bivariate scatter plot that we have seen many times during this course now. Now, for the value which is, let us say, you know, 11, you know, the, the, the corresponding Zs plus h or the value nearby is close to 18, right? If I were to not remove this and calculate 2 gamma h at, you know, location 11 with h1, it will be definitely pulled in, you know, quite a bit by this difference of 7 between these values, right? If I, and if I include these, the data seem quite scattered and the correlation or the covariance in this data seem to be low. So, the spatial dependence is sort of becoming weaker due to this, you know, uh, uh, this spread that the outlier values are bringing to this, uh, this scenario. If I were to exclude these values and only focus on the values, uh, you know, that are in the middle, then the correlation or seems quite high, right? Things to seem to be moving in a direction closer. And as I sort of keep on excluding the outlier values further, you know, I will have a smaller core which will look, you know, more and more spatially dependent, okay? So, variogram by itself is not a resistant statistic, it can lead to a misestimation of spatial dependence in the presence of outlier data values. That is why we conducted exploratory data analysis before we introduced the variogram, right? That is why it is very important to exclude the, very, uh, the outlier values before you go on to do spa conduct spatial prediction or conduct spatial regression, okay? Because in the presence of these outlier values, the uh, you know, the, 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 the covariance structure, the spatial covariance structure in your data is going to be messed up and everything that will follow, no matter how sophisticated your, did your analysis is, it will be a misestimation, okay? All right. So, there is a resistant version of the variogram which is not so popular. Well, it uses the modulus of the difference which does not allow the penalty to be squared. It takes the penalty and square roots it. Right, and then conduct some 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 uh, some power adjustment, some normalizing factor adjustment, but it provides us a median analog of a resistant variogram. Right, so Cressy and Hawkins provided this version of a resistant variogram uh, in 1980. Right, okay. So, uh, so this is just an understanding of you know when we have the Zi. Zsi minus Zs, the whole squared, 
you know values which is the semi variogram or the variogram cloud by itself including the outliers you can see that the, the distribution the distribution is very highly skewed to the left right whereas if i look at the representation which the resistant statistic is using which is the square root of the modulus or absolute difference between these uh, these these uh, locally uh, you know situated values uh, you know then the distribution seems much more tighter and perhaps closer to what we are used to okay so so that's the utility that we see you know uh, experimentally we can see that even with the groundwater data that that is uttar pradesh data that is a real world data set we see the difference right away when it comes to uh, you know measuring spatial dependence in the data okay and very small you know these small values will exhibit large spatial dependence that is to be expected you know it's groundwater data how how much will it change uh, you know as we move through the space right it's a geographical structure right beneath our uh, the ground uh, but it is not going to be like tubs or you know walls uh, you know built together it's it's a large tub over space right um, okay all right so so let's come back from the digression to this semi semi variogram cloud and now sort of start to build the experimental variogram which is taking the mean value at each h you know h h value taking the mean of this cluster points at each h value okay that will give us the 2 gamma h uh, representation right as we understand it so let's see how the experimental variogram looks like not a surprise the experimental variogram is just a point a just a point at each h value and the point is nothing but the mean of all these you know uh, 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 you know uh, scatter plot points or the cloud points z s minus z s plus h squared so you sum them you divide it by the total number of such values at a given h that gives you a 2 gamma h value right now uh, we have understood a few characteristics of this uh, experimental variogram uh, you know as a class exercise what you can do is now take a 2 minute pause and locate the nugget the range and the sill on this variogram so i will come back in 2 minutes pause your video come back in 2 minutes and then i will explain where to locate the range the sill and the nugget of these variogram we studied these with uh, the theoretical variogram all these parameters are the properties of a variogram okay welcome back um, so in order to locate the nugget a range and sill we simply have to fall back on their definitions what is a range a range is a lag distance at which the variogram reaches the sill okay sill is the large scale variation in data remember it's c0 right so it's the it's the level of 2 gamma h value uh, when uh, you know uh, 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 when there is no correlation in the data so the sill is just the distance between uh, the origin and the vertical distance to the no correlation point is the sill this is the sigma squared the c0 however you want to represent it at the so you know the the point from the origin on the x axis that the farther that we have to go to get to this point that this sill is called as the range the range represents the distance from any given location to which there is some spatial dependence in data beyond the range there is no spatial dependence in data that means for our groundwater data set the groundwater level at tail will provide no information about groundwater level at head where the head lies farther away from the range value uh, which is the threshold value after which we have no spatial dependence no information whatsoever in order to predict uh, what to expect okay uh, the nugget is a micro scale variation we know its notation it's c0 right on a theoretical variogram the nugget is something that where you know uh, we have c0 right 
So nugget is the two gamma h value when h approaches zero, right? So this is uh, two gamma h when h approaches zero. Clearly, and something that we have discussed earlier, that the data are usually we are not able to you know collect data very very close to zero. Like in this case, you know I need a data point which was at a location where I just moved out from, like, you know, from zero. So I needed data points that were very, very close, right? So I needed, you know, where would this two gamma h value be just right outside this point location S0. So I should be able to do it for all sample points, if not some. Now we said that usually we don't have these understandings or we we can't realistically collect data. We, if we are, you know, digging a large, like a large enough sort of, you know, uh, ob monitoring well for groundwater, we are doing it at, at a location, you will never see a well right beside it. You know, it's, it's, it's nonsensical really, right? So what we do is that this, we consider this C0 to be composed of a measurement error, a measurement error and a white noise a white noise representation of it. So it's really predicted from the data rather than being calculated or estimated directly, okay? And SIL is just the large scale variation in data, something that we have uh, discussed in detail now, okay? I hope this makes the, your understanding of an experimental variogram very, very clear. You know, I, 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 I sincerely hope so, okay? So some, you know, couple of last sort of, uh, you know, ending pointers in this lecture is that by looking at the variogram, we can, you know, we saw that, you know, we started with the bivariate scatter plot, what we, which we called as the H scatter plot. And we said we can get a sense of the variogram value. I am now going to go back and complete, close the loop. That is, we can start with the variogram and predict variogram plot, variogram graph, and predict how the covariogram or the H, uh, you know, uh, the bivariate scatter plot, which is the H scatter plot, could look like, right? So consider what we are looking at, uh, you know, on the left hand side. Let us say we collect our H, you know, value here. Let's call this H tilde. At this H tilde, you have a large variogram value. So the two gamma H or you know, uh, a gamma H, which is a semi-variogram value is quite large, right? Um, at this level, we know there is no spatial dependence in the data, no or little spatial dependence in the data. Hence, the bivariate scatter plot will be scattered to a large extent around the 45 degree line. That is a representation that perhaps there is no correlation in these data at that H value. But what if we were to look at this at a different H, let's say, let's call it H star, okay? At H star, what happens is the variogram value or the semi-variogram value is small. So if the semi-variogram value is small, that means there is, you know, significant spatial correlation in these data. There is quite a bit of spatial contiguity, uh, spatial dependence going on around this value H, right? At the distance H from any given location, I will have a healthy dependence. That healthy dependence will mean that the data will be, will be scattered tightly, more tightly around the 45 degree line, right? Why? Because if all these scatter, all these data points in the H scatter plot were to sort of, were to be located on the 45 degree line, we have a correlation of one, which is perfect correlation. That is the place where, you know, the value of you know, if at any h star, or h double star, the value of gamma h drops to zero, that is perfect correlation. We, I, I've never observed such a situation with real world data sets, but theoretically that's what it is, right? So, so when we started this lecture, we said we can sort of, you know, look at the h bivariate scatter plot, which is coming from local stationarity idea, something that we have seen earlier and start to predict what a variogram value could be, you know, experimental variogram look like. Now I'm saying we can go the other way around too, which is, which should make sense, right? Which is intuitive. Finally, spatial contiguity 
you know, which is a smoothness in the data set. Overall, large scale spatial contiguity means how spatially dependent values are in their local, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, proximity. Now, if we look at the first figure, uh, it is a coarse, it is a coarse image, right? I mean, it's, it's an image, let's say you pick a picture from your camera, you keep zooming, you keep zooming, and you come to a very coarse pixelated understanding of, of the world. Whereas you can have a smooth image, which is, let's say, let's call this image three, and from one to three, we are moving from a coarse to a smooth image. The variograms on the left, the variograms on the left provide us a very distinct understanding of these images. For a coarse image, there is a large nugget, right? For a smooth image, there is almost no nugget effect, right? So when you calculate a variogram or estimate a variogram, given the shape of the variogram. For example, if we go back, if I have a variogram which looks like, you know, which sort of bends down to this value, it seems like the data are going to be quite coarse from the example that we were looking at previously, right? And if you have a situation where the, 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 the value will be small, the nugget effect is small, you are perhaps looking at a very smooth image. So the visual and the graphical understanding that the variogram encapsulates is very clear from this slide. This data are coming from Perch and Dosh 2014, uh, but they're very informative in, in the sense of what to expect of a visual image if you look at the variogram and vice versa, okay? Uh, all right, so this image now says that we are going to move from an experimental variogram, a calculation-based variogram to a variogram model. Now, a model, unlike these mean scatter plots of, you know, square differences, is a smoother representation of the variogram itself. Why should we go from an experimental to a, you know, to a, uh, a modeled version of a variogram? Well, we should, we should do that because, look, for a given h value, we have infinitely many directions that we can pick if we were to really get serious about or literal about, you know, the experiment, the, 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 you know, uh, how are we defining our lags, right? Even if I fix this h, I can just keep on changing it by delta, keep on doing it, keep on doing it. It's probably going to be countably many, many times before I can even get all the unique, you know, uh, uh, lagged pairs of data for a given value of h. Imagine doing it for different or uh, different values of h or distinct values of the lag vector h, that is the distance h, right? That is an ominous exercise. We don't want to be doing that. It's like, you know, spatial prediction. We cannot be sampling everything. It's, if you were to sample a population, then, you know, what is the role of statistics? What we are doing is we are getting some representation of the variogram at you let's say the north south east west southeast northwest and the you know uh, northeast southwest direction and that's about it we are going to then use it to generalize what is the variogram value at that given edge no matter what direction you move into right so to be able to do that we need to move to a model version of a variogram and that is the next step that we will start to look at in the next lecture we will do this uh, we will we'll study modeling uh, variogram models in the next lecture, okay? So that's about it for today's, for this lecture, for lecture 13. Uh, I hope uh, this was, uh, you know, uh, enjoyable and knowledgeable for you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. See you next time. Mm -hmm.